was dozing off and suddenly I heard this sort of noise. This sort of stuff going on on the bedside table. Ah. Freeze. I feel, I feel the room actually freezing. Sort of a cold chill coming into it now. I feel like things go up my back. So I woke her up and she could hear the same thing going on, you know. This, this sort of music, moving, movement. So I started to tell her, I was going for a few minutes, and I started to tell her about some of the things that were happening here, you know. And then it stopped. And then you could hear this movement down on the floor of the bedroom. I said, geez, whatever it is, is playing with the fold up alarm clock. Because you could feel that, you could hear the clock being moved around. So I turned on the bedside light really quick, and there it was, over by the door, 10 to 3 in the morning, the clock on its side. Michael is a tough, hard-working Irish farmer. He and his family have been working Bally Phillip Farm in County Wicklow, in the east of Ireland, for over 50 years. The farm itself goes back much longer than that, over 350 years, to the beginnings of the 17th century. So it's been through some of Ireland's most troubled and turbulent times. There are three generations living in the farmhouse, the grandmother, Michael and his sister, and a clutch of children and all of them have been touched by the strange, unexplained series of events that have been going on at the farm for as long as anyone can remember. Eileen, the sister, for example, still has a vivid memory of an event that occurred way back in her childhood. I must have been about 13 at the time, going to bed and hearing this noise out here in the garden. And, like, we're a large family, so we're used to big birthday parties, you know, half the neighbourhood in. And I thought, that is strange. There shouldn't be anybody here at this hour of night, you know? Looking out the window and seeing, it was like a mass of colours all kind of swirling around, like children at a big party all. You could hear the laughter and the shapes, but I couldn't really identify one particular shape as such. It was like a big, yeah, kaleidoscope of colours, you know, and laughter. I thought, that's odd. I didn't think anything more of it. And years later, I mean, I didn't really speak about it either because I thought they'd send me to a madhouse, you know? And uh, years later, my other sister said she'd also experienced the same thing. Strangely enough, in more recent times, a friend staying at the house claims to have seen a very similar event, as if it were a cluster of children dancing around a maypole. Well, about, it must be 10 years ago now, I stayed down here. I used to stay down here regularly. I stayed down here this particular night. And I got up about one o'clock, half one in the morning to go to the toilet um, in that bathroom window there. And I could see a silhouette of, looks. It, it looked like children playing out in the garden and I could hear them. And I looked out the window and I, I thought nothing more of it. Went to bed, got up the next morning and I said to Connor, my friend, I said, uh, I see uh, Robert's kids were out last night playing for the, the party or whatever and he says oh no they they didn't they weren't here last night they weren't staying in, in the area there's no neighbors near us here more strangely still during some construction work in the early 80s when an old plum tree had to be dug out they found tangled in its roots a large block of stone it had a hole in the center as if it were the base for a pole could it perhaps have been the site of an old maypole indeed it was during this construction work particularly the draining and digging out of a stream, that the strange, unexplained activity in the house began to increase, to such an extent that nobody could avoid talking about it. A constant succession of small, slightly disturbing events that nagged away at the mind. The sort of experience, for example, that Michael's mother had in the kitchen. It's about half past nine, she heard these footsteps running down along the landing, down the stairs, the front door opening and slamming shut, and she ran into the... Uh, into the dining room so she could see up the avenue and she didn't see any of the family running up the road. Then she thought maybe it was one of the kids they'd come back to get some school books or something. So she phoned up the schools. No, they were all there at nine o'clock. So um, later on that morning she was uh, evidently cooking the dinner and she felt something in the scullery. She just happened to look around she saw the lid of the where the potatoes were boiling and the lid was just uh, maybe a foot up over the pot and just went gently back down again. And she was saying to us at dinner time that, um, that she thought that we might have a poltergeist in the house. And we certainly thought, don't be silly. You know, 
things like that don't happen, you know, I mean, that's only in the movies. So, um, dinner was just about over. I was waiting for the half one news to come on. My father was reading The Independent, I was reading The Irish Times, my mother was in getting the coffee and the dessert ready. And suddenly all three of us could hear these footsteps going down on the landing right overhead. And my mother came charging into the kitchen and said, Now, you heard that, you heard that. It is true, I, I'm, not, I'm not imagining things, so. My sister Christine was home once and I, and we heard, we'd leave the door between the bedrooms open in case something would happen, you know? So the door was left open anyway, and now she comes into me, I, there's a noise on the back stairs, you know? So I grab a stick or something, and we stood, the two of us stand there, and I said, right, I get him now, and stood up at the top of the stairs, there's a doorway down, and uh, we hear the footsteps, and they're like big, heavy, heavy, plodding footsteps coming up the stairs, right? It was halfway up, I said, right, I open the door now, I catch you wherever it is. Open the door, nothing. Now, that, that was common to hear these footsteps, you know? Uh, my mother thought she saw a child at the end of her bed, and she sat up in the bed and she saw this child, and the child seemingly had wet, curly hair, about eight, nine, ten years old, and had a long, old-fashioned nightgown on it. And my mother assumed it was my brother's daughter and uh, said, go back up to your own house, you shouldn't be down here. Your parents will be fuming if they knew you're out of bed. So with that, my mother lay down and she's facing the wall and suddenly the child came round to the side of the bed and put his nose right down to my mother's and just smiled. And with that, my mother turned towards my father in the bed and just thought, oh gosh, what's, what's happening? The story of a boy with wet hair became a recurring theme, and it linked to one of the strangest sequences of events that involved the children. Barra, for example, Michael's son, talked of playing around the house with a phantom child, a child who came to acquire the name of Thomas. It was absolutely lashing rain out there, really thundering rain. And Barra said to me, because the window, the curtain was over, and I was in the kitchen making the lunch, and he said to me, there's a small child outside, and he's really, really wet, will you let him in? And I said, God, it must be Sean now, you know, one of the nephews, and I'll, I'll go out and get him, he shouldn't be out in the rain. And I went, I went to the window and there was no one there, and he was really persistent now, really getting into a temper about it. And I said, OK. He's ran down the avenue there, so I said, I'll go out. So I got, I got an umbrella and one of Michael's coats and I put it on and I said, I'll go out. But there was no child there, but he was really persistent that there was a child there. And then he explained to me that he was, he was about... He was a little bigger than him, but really, really wet. And that's when things really did start then. Now, myself and my son lived in Denmark for several years and didn't know of all these comings and goings of Thomas and... God knows who else, you know. And I was out picking onions and little Sean was only three. So he was playing away in the treehouse and he came up to tell me all about Thomas. I said, who is Thomas, you know? But there was nobody, nobody actually in the treehouse at all. So it was only later I discovered who he was and didn't encourage it. <laughs> the treehouse playmate. We were sitting in the kitchen one day and we are at the table and I was doing drawing with Barra, because Barra loves drawing. And I could feel this real cold breeze in my legs and all the, d the doors were closed and the heating was on because it was a winter's day. And, oh God, it was really, really getting cold now. And then Barra says to me, my friend's under the table. And I said, oh, is he? Because I, at this stage I was really thinking, now this could be an imaginary friend, because children have this. And next minute, the door flung open and the cupboard in the kitchen. And, well, I said to Barra, tell your friend to close that door, because I'm not getting up to close it. And he told him, he said, well, he won't. And then it got real warm again, and then the child had obviously gone. So I said to Barra, the next time that your friend's here, tell me and I want to meet him. So it was after lunch one day, and he came out and he goes, oh, my friend's behind the sofa his heart away like someone was really tickling him and I remember looking in and I saw Barra he always sits with his feet crossed and I remember him sitting here on the carpet and seeing a shadow of it was like a little boy well I couldn't tell it was, little, it was like a little child these strange events 
disturbed Michael perhaps more than anyone else. And he began to dig into the history of the farm. He found that in the 1700s, it had been owned by the Livesey family. And then towards the end of the 1800s, it was passed over to a family called McKee. And they did have a son called Thomas. The story in the village is that in 1902, Thomas, age 10, was drowned in the river along the banks where Michael was carrying out his landscaping work. And in the churchyard, there is a gravestone where the remains of young Thomas lie with those of the rest of the McKee family. All through the 80s, in the lonely farmhouse in County Wicklow, the strange happenings went on. A whole series of out of the ordinary, unexplained events. Not enough to alarm people, but enough to raise the question, what on earth is going on? And steadily, the events became more obvious, more dramatic. There was the time, for example, when, after it had been locked up securely, the whole house was found wide open, with the television going full blast. So when Sandra came in, I told her this. When I go out to work and you go up to the village with Fleur, her friend, and with the kids, to make sure that she locks all the windows and doors. So I came in for my 10 o'clock tea break, and every door and window downstairs was wide open. The radio was on and the television was on. I was actually very angry. I, I was fuming with Sandra for, you know, leaving it open like that for me, telling her how concerned I was. There was one time, Michael always told me to lock all the doors when he's going, when I was going out to Kilcoon, and I had locked them all. And he hit me when I came back and said that I hadn't locked them. And I had locked every single one because my friend was with me. But things really came to a head when whatever force it was that was active in the house began to interfere with the children. My wife had gone to work in Dublin. I'd left in the car at maybe seven o'clock-ish. So I was down here around half seven with the kids getting them their breakfast and having my own breakfast. And I was waiting for Sandra, the child minder, to come in. And my youngest boy was playing on that seat over there and he was trying to scramble up it. And suddenly he, he seemed to be something that just pushed him off and he landed right here on the floor beside me. I had came in and Michael said to me that that fake had been flung. At this stage you would really only be starting to got used to walking. But then my friend was over with her little daughter and we were having a cup of coffee and next minute Theok and this little child just were flung up against the wall and that was the end of it. That wasn't, that wasn't a child spirit but it wasn't, it was a very evil spirit because if anything wants to hurt children it's obviously evil. So I got the two children up and we ran out and I said to Michael, I'm not staying in there anymore now until because that's, that's not a joke anymore. Michael felt he had to take some action, but what? He happened to know someone who practiced as a psychic medium in Dublin. And in some tension, he spoke to her on the phone. She was also called Sandra. I was on the phone. Uh, Sandra, the childminder, was there with my youngest boy, and Fleur, her friend, was inside with her daughter. And uh, I was chatting away to Sandra, and I said, told her how it happened. And she said, ah, don't worry about it. I've just been reading about this chap in England who's made friends with his poltergeist. It can make him tea and coffee. It can get books down off bookshelves and even open them on the right pages. And she says, well, you'd even get some money. And I said, don't be stupid. So how can I get, get your money? And with that, out of the corner of my eye, I saw Fleur in that room in there, both straight, upright. The lining was out of her pocket. And at my foot was a bundle of money. Now, seemingly she'd been to, up to collect her children's allowance that morning and she had about £90 wrapped up in a rubber band. Now, she didn't rummage in her pocket, stand up for her and then throw it at my foot. She was just, I just saw it, just, just as quick as that. She was upright and the money was at my foot and the lining was out of her pocket. So what was going on at Bally Phillip Farm? All those strange, seemingly impossible events. Scientists in the field have two main theories to explain so-called poltergeist activity, and they're both pretty remarkable. One is that it's essentially internal, the result of deep underlying psychic activity in the people involved, something they may be completely unaware of, having an effect on their environment. It's the mind, if you like, affecting matter, and they call it psychokinesis. If poltergeist effects are real, if they're not just due to fraud or due to natural physical phenomena, 
it's amazing even if they are due to psychokinesis. If it really is true that the mind is affecting the, the, the room at a physical level, that is, that is amazing anyway. You don't have to adopt a spiritualistic interpretation of poltergeist effects to, to say that is, that is amazing. It, it really is amazing anyway. And for that reason, of course, the majority of physicists and scientists probably would refuse to countenance the reality of these phenomena. But my own view is that one should not be that dogmatic. I think there is at least some evidence that there are perhaps unexplained phenomena occurring in poltergeist cases which might be attributed to psychokinetic powers. The second, no less remarkable, is that it's external, an unexplained, often whimsical focus of energy, perhaps linked to a troubled spirit, moving things around and causing strange events. It's almost as if it is an external or independent entity which is playing tricks, terrifying the whole family. And the question is, why? Is it because it is an earthbound? Uh, if such things exist, is it someone who actually, in a confused state, is actually saying, what, what are all these people doing in my house? I should get rid of them. I will scare them out. Then you get a sort of interaction. And quite often, you find that you have to take that theory seriously. But wherever the source of the disturbances, eventually in 1993, an exorcism was carried out at the farmhouse, and it seemed to have some effect. Things quietened down. But the happenings over the past 10 years have had their effect upon the family. Michael, in particular, has a sense of an altogether darker, more sinister undercurrent that lingers on. In his mind, it's linked to the history of the area, a record of extraordinary violence and brutality, going back to the Civil War of 1798. If the truth be known, during this most bloody period of Irish history, 1798 was just like one horrendous civil war. You could nearly compare it to what happened in Bosnia in, recent, in the recent past. It was brother against brother, father against son, neighbour against neighbour. It was Catholic and Protestants and Presbyterians fighting on both sides. Um, what they did to each other doesn't, despair, doesn't bear a description. It was wanton terror. He has identified, for example, the houses and indeed the burial places of some of the ringleaders of the worst atrocities. One lived on his farm. But it seems that in all cases, there has been a long record of unusual activity. The um, most notorious of them would have been Griffith Jones, uh, Bob Lisley, and uh, Moses Fox, and of course the Hangman Hampton Star. And the strange thing is that to this day, all these places where these people lived, all their houses, there seems to be a problem of um, paranormal activities, and we don't know what it is exactly. And I'm convinced that it's because of their wanton cruelty in the past that's still trying to say something today. It's something trying to get through to us. It's quite often that farmhouses would acquire a kind of sinister atmosphere because if uh, there were incidents recorded there during the 98 Rebellion, and that they had associated with them personalities from that time. For anyone who knows a little about the 98s, they were savage, and both sides were savage and cruel. And there was a tremendous amount of ill will because you had brother against brother and father against son, and the whole ethos of a kind of bitterness would have infected a house. Michael believes this violent and bloodthirsty heritage accounts for some of the psychic events in which people claim to have experienced real fear. Susan, for example, was staying with her son Danny in a mobile home on the farm. This night I woke up and I found Danny in the bed with me and he was completely rigid. He was in an upright, sitting upright position and he was completely rigid and ice cold. His eyes were open wide, but he, he wouldn't respond to me. He was in some kind of a peculiar trance. And there was the usual very cold atmosphere in the, the, the mobile, which you 
always associate with stories about ghosts and things. And I was filled with a, a terror, an absolute terror and a kind of a loathing feeling. And I knew in my heart and soul if I didn't get Danny out of this situation that somehow he would be harmed or something would happen. I just knew that. Now to get him out, I had to go down the length of the mobile into the sitting room area to collect my handbag, which had my car keys in it, right? Now, the lights were flashing. There was like static electricity all over the caravan. The lights were flashing. The radio was all static. And I swung my legs out of the bed and stood up. And it was like somebody had poured glue over me. I couldn't get myself moving and the more I the more frightened I got to get down and get the bag this was the main objective get out the more I thought about that the heavier this kind of oppression got and it was like fighting my way through glue now I suppose the mobile would have been about 32 feet in length which would take you a couple of seconds to walk from one end to the other. It took me nearly 20 minutes because I had a clock on the wall and I could see. I got down eventually and I got the keys and I got back and Danny was still in the same position, completely rigid and ice cold. And really, I don't know how I did it, but I just wrapped a blanket around him and got him out into the car and I took off like a bat out of hell. The story from County Wicklow is undoubtedly a strange and puzzling one. The psychic activity has gone on for so long. It's been experienced by 14 or 15 different people of all ages and personalities. And the events continue to this very day. It would seem that this case is destined to join the large number of mysterious cases that science cannot yet explain. But cases which, as several leading scientists have put it, can no longer simply be brushed aside. What does it mean to be described as the most haunted house in England? That is the reputation that Shingle Hall has acquired. How did it come about? How does such a reputation distort and colour the events that go on here? Shingle Hall in West Lancashire is a place with a long and murky history. It goes back to the beginning of the 13th century. People lived and worked in a moated farmhouse here when the Knights of Europe were marching off to the Crusades. Later on, during the Reformation, this place was a sanctuary for Roman Catholics in the area. The place is full of tunnels and crannies in which Catholic priests used to hide. People risked their lives to come and practice the rituals of the Mass here. Jingle Hall was a secret Mass centre at the time of the religious persecution. And we have priest hides because they came and practised Mass. When Mass was about to be said, a candle was lit in the Mass window in the porch and the flame would go across and light up the mass window on the outer wall. So the local people knew that if there was a candle shining in the mass window, mass was about to be said at Jingle Hall and it was safe to come. 
Now, if the authorities came and found that people were practicing mass here, they would be taken away and killed. It wasn't a case of don't let it happen again. They were taken away and killed. In modern times, Shingle Hall has always had a ghostly reputation. It's the local haunted house. Although for people brought up in the village, that has always been treated as something of a joke. We never actually saw any ghosts, but we always, always because it was storm lanterns and candles and an old um, coal fire and wood fire, so it was always dark and flickery inside. But it was tradition that all the youngsters had to go out of the back door, uh, the rear door in the lounge, and the stairs sort of go upwards along a landing and then past what was reputed to be the haunted room. Stamp on the floor at the end and it used to take us, oh, it seemed like 10 minutes, probably two minutes to get to the end, but only two seconds to get downstairs after we'd banged on the floor. But despite that, many people who've had cause to visit the place for one reason or another describe strange experiences they've had here that, to say the least, are difficult to explain away. John Green, for example, came here simply to install some central heating. He will never forget the experience. After three, two, probably two to three days, I thought maybe I was getting a little bit behind. I'll ask another engineer to come with me. I brought him over on the Wednesday morning, took him through the job and said, there's this radiator to finish, the tank in the loft, etc., etc." We came to this fireplace, which was already finished. The pipe work was in. All this here was in and in position. It just needed the, the actual boiler to be connected. As I turned to say this, I looked round and to my amazement, there was nothing there. This lot had gone. Yeah. So I went over to see Mrs. Kirkham, who was upstairs. I said, Judy, we come down. Somebody's taken my pipe work out or whatever. As we came back into the room, everything was back as it was before. I don't really know um, what ghosts may be. All I can say is that I have had an experience here and it has changed my thoughts of belief on, on the supernatural or whatever you may call it. Terry Whittaker is a radio producer who decided to spend a night at Shingle Hall and do some recordings. Again, he will never forget it. At about 20 to 1 in the morning, uh, we heard footsteps out here in the corridor. And two of us came out to, to see if there was anybody out here. I, I was still there, and the other, the other chap was still there. And in old, old floorboards, when anybody walks on them, they spring. And these are actually springing. And we watched them, uh, watched as, as this invisible entity walked across. And then we looked over here, and, and standing just here, with his arms tucked in his sleeves, and his cowl up, was a monk. We couldn't see his face for the cowl. We could see him standing here. It was as solid looking as you or I. And after about 30 seconds, he just drifted, rather than walked, forward, through a huge cupboard that was here, uh, and straight into the wall which afterwards we realised was the entrance to the priest's hide, the original entrance to the priest's hide. The strange thing about it was we'd been following these ghosts, chasing ghosts for 12 weeks for the series, and we'd not come across anything. And then suddenly on this particular night, there we are on our last programme, faced with a, a phantom monk. These kinds of extraordinary experience are a regular occurrence. Indeed, there have been so many strange happenings at Shingle Hall that it has become the focus of a great deal of paranormal research to try to pin down something of what is going on here. The method of investigation that we've used here mainly is experience rather than scientific methods. Um, people that come here with me, investigators or sceptics and believers alike, from different, um, different jobs, different types of people, different ages, and they all come here looking for something that hopefully they're going to see. Um, but that doesn't happen here very often. More often you have other kinds of experiences, things which can be scientifically recorded. And the simple equipment that we have used here involves tape recorders, video observations, single lens reflex cameras. And with all those different kinds of equipment, we have come up with evidence here. We've had photographs of ghosts taken, not seen at the time, but when later on films have been developed of photographs taken here, um, at the time of exposure, something has obviously been around because something has been appeared on the film afterwards, some kind of image. These are some of the strange photographs that have been taken. This one, for example, seems to show a swirl or a spiral of energy with a slightly mannequin shape. 
Many of them show vague, misty outlines in various parts of the rooms or on the stairs. They're similar to other photographs taken in houses where paranormal activity is frequent. The key point is they all come from ordinary visitors' snaps. No one was aware of anything when the snaps were taken. The images were revealed only in the printing. But of course, it's difficult to verify that these are anything other than fogging or perhaps some more elaborate deception. The same is true of the recordings taken during sittings. This one, for example, claims to record the sound of an eerie and guttural scream. It was analyzed and defined as not coming from a human throat. But again, these are scarcely acceptable as evidence of anything. Indeed, that is one of the commonest scientific responses to much of what goes on at Shingle Hall, part hoax, part hokum. We do not know, unfortunately, the nature and the context that the experiences took place in. Because the experiences are anecdotal, it would be dangerous to interpret anything much else from that. If we have strict scientific conditions there, if we do a series or a long-term investigation there, when such things do go on, when we can eliminate such things with perhaps sealed doors, where they are more structurally sealed but can still be broken by, by a force similar to that of just a human walking into a room or something. And they are again, in thoroughly controlled conditions, opened, manipulated, the sounds are then occurred, we can measure them, monitor them, experience them even, and then make a, a far better informed judgement from. It's very dangerous dealing with the anecdotal. But the paranormal is by definition anecdotal. The fact that scientists can't get a grip on what is happening here can't measure it or correlate it, let alone repeat it in any meaningful way, that simply describes the problems that science has in dealing with the paranormal. It certainly doesn't prove that these happenings aren't happening. And I was in the chapel here with a party from New Zealand, and one girl suddenly turned around and she said, oh, look at the white habited figure against the wall. And we turned, and there was a monk standing by the wall there very, very clear. You couldn't see his features. He had his hand like this up against his face as if, he, as if he was guarding his features. And he was there for about a full minute and then he gradually faded. And my other sighting was up in the John Wall room upstairs. And as you probably know, people in those days were much smaller. than when The men were five feet and under and the women even smaller. And he was standing beside the door, which is a very small door, and he was standing beside it. You could see again the cowled head, the folded arms and the, the robes. And he was there for a full minute and then he gradually faded away. He was very, very clear. I was sat next to the window. Somebody was sat next to me. We had the lights off and everyone was being really quiet. We were trying to be quiet, trying to listen. And I heard the sound and I, and I just thought it was my heart at first because my heart was beating so fast. And it was unmistakable I don't know, Latin chanting and the feeling of oppression in the room was just unbelievable. It, I just felt, I had put my jumper over my head actually. Even though I couldn't see anything anyway, I was just really frightened and I, I asked half, somebody to come out with me because the, it was just a really bad feeling in there as if something, as if you just captured a minute of something that had happened in there and you just like, got a taste of it and it's something more unnerving than you could ever imagine. I was coming here to do some uh, filming about some research that was going on in Chingle Hall, so we thought it'd be a, a good idea to stay the night. And basically what turned out, what we thought would be a fun evening, just turned into a complete nightmare. I mean, I will never, this is the closest you'll get me inside Chingle Hall because I will not go through the door. It just, it scared me rigid. A great deal of time has been spent at Shingle Hall trying to identify just who some of the most frequently seen apparitions might be. Although there have been many sightings of monk-like figures, as it happens, some of the most prominent stories are linked to two women. One of them is Margaret Howarth. She owned Shingle Hall in the 50s and led a very social life here. The legend has it that she loved Shingle Hall so much she's never been able to tear herself away, despite her death. There are many extraordinary stories told about the Grey Lady, as she's called. And a young couple came up one evening. They'd heard about Chingle Hall, and they thought, oh, we'd like to have a look round here. So they came up, 
didn't know if anybody would be there or if it would be empty. And they knocked on the sanctuary knocker, and this little old lady answered the door. And they said, oh, we'd like to have a look around Jingle Hall. Is it possible for you to show us around? And she said, oh, certainly, come in. She showed them all around the hall, and they were fascinated, and told, she told them all the stories of all these things that happened to her. And eventually they said goodbye, and off they went. And they said, she said, oh, my name's Mrs. Howarth. And they went down to the pub, they went in, and they were talking to the locals, and they said, oh, we've just been up to Jingle Hall, and Mrs. Howarth has showed us around, and we're fascinated with it. And they said, Mrs. Howarth died 12 months ago. Eleanor de Singleton's story is quite different. She dates from the 16th century, and she is the centre of a quite horrific story in which it's difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. She was allegedly imprisoned and abused from a young age by her uncles in one of the rooms upstairs. Eleanor de Singleton was um, the last person from the de Singleton line to have the hall, and she was about six when her parents died and she was then looked after by two uncles. She was kept in one room, which is the priest room here at Chingle Hall. Um, it's very hard to talk about, and people perhaps think it's a bit bizarre, but she was a victim of sexual abuse from six to 18 by her two uncles. And she had quite a lot of stillborn children, and she had four birthed children that actually breathed. Each one of these children were actually murdered and burnt and um, the last one was a hydrocephalic child with a, an enormous head that she died giving birth to. And a lot of the emotional trauma that she experienced in the room has somehow been locked in the atmosphere and at times is replayed to people who walk into the room, uh, especially women who often break down in floods of tears here or they have fits, they feel faint or dizzy and certainly lots of people have had a, um, a horrible experience in the room and have been taken out, not able to explain the feeling uh, that they've that's overcome them. No particular reason for it, just an overcome feeling of dread, horror, desolation, fear, and have had to be taken out of the room and out of the hall. Even given its long and troubled history, the range and complexity of the happenings at Shingle Hall is still quite remarkable. Several investigators put this down, in part at least, to its location. It lies, they say, at the crossing point of several magnetic fault lines. Now, Shingle Hall is built on crossed ley lines. The word lay is spelt L-E-Y, chore lay, burn lay, lay land. And if anything is built on ley lines, it's prone to electrical, magnetic, paranormal forces. Part of the south of Shingle Hall, near Glastonbury in Somerset, lives one of this country's most renowned experts on ley lines and their effects, Dr Roni Dougal. I have come across places where you get ley lines crossing or several ley lines converging. And they are places where you get psychic effects happening, where you get people seeing ghosts, where you get time slips, people um, seeing things that have happened at another time or experiencing things from another time. And it's part of the modern idea about ley lines, that a ley line crossing is a place of particular energy now, an awful lot of the old churches, an awful lot of old houses were actually built at these places because the people who built in those days, we're well, going back now four, five, six hundred years, were actually much more in tune with the environment than we are now. Um, they were people who lived outside much more, they walked more, they were out there on their horses, and they were very aware of what places felt like. Shingle Hall, I understand, is on the intersection of two underground geological fault lines, producing strong seismic activity and, and uh, possibly microwave radiation. These can very easily give rise to uh, phenomena in the brain that would cause anything from visual and auditory hallucinations to senses of fear or elation or tingling, definite body reactions, all of which people would interpret as something paranormal, whereas in fact they can be actually reproduced by beaming certain frequencies at uh, people in those situations. In fact, this has been developed uh, in a more uh, macabre way by the US military who are using certain frequencies for crowd control and for definite military situations. 
if you hypothesize that the, the truly paranormal is some frequencies that we are not normally sensitive to in the huge range of the electromagnetic spectrum that is out there, then yes, it is quite possible, particularly if you're electrically shocked, as it seems to be the case, that areas that you otherwise normally are blocked out from you, uh, you could suddenly become very sensitive to and react paranormally. Others would argue there is a far more straightforward explanation, namely that people get from Shingle Hall exactly what they expect to get, a bit of a thrill. Many people indeed are prepared to pay for the excitement of spending a night here, and the argument goes they come to the place filled with paranormal expectations. You will be looking for, for two things not to be there, prior knowledge and expectation. Unfortunately, every experience at Chingle Hall has prior knowledge of the building being haunted and the expectation of what's around every corner. These to a very, very high level. And those with, added with the other ingredients, um, again, gives me um, reason for concern. But can that be a complete answer, the extraordinary range of events that have been experienced here by people from all walks of life with totally different personalities and characters and expectations? We spoke, for example, to a group of ordinary people who had spent the night at Shingle Hall. They had no doubt whatsoever about the disturbing nature of their experiences. Going up towards three o'clock in the morning, Jason said, like, if you want, we'll have a seance. And I, I'm thinking to myself, I thought, oh, right, yeah, <laughs> I've heard about the sort of thing. And uh, I wasn't feeling any, any strangeness or anything. And, uh, Whatever it was seemed to pick on me straight away. <laughs> um, I felt a cold shiver down my back. Then no sooner it warmed up and there was a feeling of a tremendous pressure on my back. It was like, um, like somebody had two hands on my back and they were pushing me really hard and I was holding myself against it. A really incredible force of pressure. But it didn't just stop on my back, it actually came through my body with all, you know the force was unbelievable and when it actually came out of the front of my body and relieved me and I were actually I were absolutely gasping for breath and no sooner had it left me my wife Wendy was sat on my left another girl Angela that was sat on my right they both experienced the same thing and at one stage I had floods of tears rolling down my face. I wasn't uh, feeling any depression or sadness or anything. Uh, it was just an overwhelming experience of tears. And it was quite late and uh, I heard this clanging, crashing noise in the porch um, and wanted to go investigate it. So I opened the door and uh, to my amazement, what I saw was this chair um, physically moving on its own and making a hell of a noise because obviously it's a tile floor here and the chair was doing this uh, violent movements um, and obviously I witnessed this and I was on my own I wanted to go and get someone else to see it so I shouted to my friend Andy who came and the rest of them didn't want to come and see it um, and he he saw it I turned the light on because we wanted to see this happen and it was very very cold in here um, and turn the light on and the chair was still moving. Now obviously this sort of, it felt like a long time, but in actual time it was probably about 30 seconds. We were inside the hall with, uh, with eight nurses who were, here, who were here on a sponsored sit-in and it all started out as, as good fun and everybody was, was jovial and joking. And it, and it just, it, it turned very nasty. We were all upstairs, the first experience was about an hour after I'd arrived. And we were all upstairs sitting down in one of the, in one of the rooms. And one of the nurses who were, who were cynics at the best of time just turned and said, I can see something, there's somebody above your shoulder to one of the nurses in the corner. And the way she said it, we just knew it, it wasn't, she wasn't joking. And the nurse on the other side said, oh God, I can feel him, I can feel him, but I can't look, I'm too scared to look. And, and there were a couple of others that actually saw this figure in a hood standing above, above the nurses, and that was it. I mean, that was the first episode, and it completely freaked her. I mean, she was in tears, she couldn't talk for about an hour and a half, and it was, we knew then that it was going to be a very, a very, very long night. It was the first occasion we came, we were all sat around the fire, and we were just talking, having a, having a drink, and the, the girl who was actually sat with her back against the wall just leaned forward suddenly. She went absolutely white, the blood just went out of her face, and we were sort of leaning forward. Are you okay? And this 
a, a psychic breeze was moving around the, cr the crowd. It's as if it had come through the wall, had sensed we were there, which was looking back on it was quite unusual. It didn't walk straight through us all. It walked around us all as if it was aware that we, we were there. And then there was a, a, a heavy knock on the door. It's, it's just not similar. It's just nothing like when, when you knock the door, the sound's not like that. It's as though there's more in resonance and, it, and it, tend, it sounds like it's going throughout the whole house and through everything through you. It's really, a really bizarre sort of thing. It's, not, it's as if it's not a human that's doing it. There is no doubt that Shingle Hall has become immensely commercialised. As the most haunted house in England, it's become a nice little earner. Groups of people pay handsomely to spend a night here to experience that tingle up the spine. But one has to ask, does that make Shingle Hall any less haunted? She had a dog show on the car park and several people came up that day and said, where's the monastery? Because when we've been here, we'd like to go and visit the monastery. And she said, there's no monastery around here. And they said, well, how do you explain the monks that have been walking across the drawbridge, across the car park and disappearing into the distance?